Good evening. Welcome to Open Window. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest this evening is Philip C. Habib, former Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs and Special Presidential Envoy to the Middle East. Ambassador Habib was born in Brooklyn in 1920. He graduated from the University of Idaho in 1942 and the University of California in Berkeley, where he earned a Ph.D. in 1952. Between degrees, he served in the Army from 1942 to 1946, rising to the rank of captain. A career Foreign Service officer, Ambassador Habib joined the Foreign Service in 1949, serving in American embassies in Ottawa, New Zealand, South Korea, Saigon, and in State Department posts before being named to the American delegation to the Vietnam Peace Talks in 1968. From 1971 to 1974, he was ambassador to South Korea. At the State Department, he has served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs from 1967 to 69, and Assistant Secretary from 1974 to 1978. From 1976 to 1978, he was Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs, the highest career position in the Foreign Service. In the spring of 1981, Ambassador Habib was recalled from retirement by President Reagan and appointed Special Envoy to the Middle East. In a tour de force of shuttle diplomacy, he averted the outbreak of war in that troubled region and negotiated a ceasefire. His masterful diplomacy in defusing the crisis won him international acclaim as America's preeminent professional diplomat. During the month of April, Ambassador Habib is being honored by his alma mater, UC Berkeley. He is the speaker at the 114th Charter Day Convocation, where he will receive the Berkeley Citation, the highest award bestowed by UC Berkeley. Simultaneously, he has been appointed Regents Lecturer at the Institute of International Studies and the Institute of East Asian Studies. Ambassador Habib, welcome to Berkeley. Thank you, Harry. I'm I, very glad to be back, I might say. Do you find the campus very different from the way it was in 48? It's more crowded. There's no question. There's been a lot of buildings since I was here. And do you find the students a little scruffier than they were in, quite the, a bit scruffier. in, the, in the late 40s? But, but quite, a, quite, quite as intelligent, I might quite say. Quite as intelligent. Yeah. And you, 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 you find in their questioning of you in these sessions that they're pretty interested in, oh, they're fascinated. in world affairs. Most definitely. Uh, in fact, I'm, uh, I'm quite pleased at uh, the opportunity to talk to the, to the students. I find them not only interested, well informed. I haven't had a bad question yet, and I think I've been so far in at least uh, seven or eight different seminars and meetings. In, in looking at your, 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 your biography, I noticed that, that, that you started uh, in Brooklyn, actually. You, you, yeah, you born, were born, born, born in, a, in a Jewish neighborhood, and your father was a, a Lebanese grocer. That's right. Uh, it, it was a long trek to Idaho and then, and then to Berkeley. How, how did you happen to, to go west in seeking your education? Well, in some ways, I'm a child of the Depression of the 30s. And uh, first of all, I wanted uh, in those days to uh, be a forester. And I went to Idaho, which had an excellent forestry school, as does the University of California. It was also, uh, it wasn't so costly to go to school in the small un uh, state universities in those days. Uh, so that uh, the trek westward was a natural uh, consequence of both my interest uh, and my finances. Right, and, and you, you were essentially on scholarship and, and worked your uh, way uh, through school. Uh, constantly. Right. Uh, I, in those days, uh, you didn't fly home for Christmas vacation. You didn't go to Fort Lauderdale for Easter. You. Uh, you stayed on the campus, generally, sp I did anyway, uh, and all summer long you worked. I used to work in the woods every summer and uh, pick up enough money to buy a pair of pants to go back to school in the fall. Mm -hmm. uh, those were not affluent days by any means. But then uh, uh, the present generation of students, uh, if my own children are, are representative, don't really want to hear about the olden days, Harry, <laughs> <laughs> and how difficult it was for us. 
And, and Berkeley, you came to Berkeley because I of your interest Berkeley in after the war. But it, uh, because of your interest in in in, in agricultural economics, or well, because of, of the opportunities. Well, here? I had been before uh, before the war. I was uh, I had been uh, given a scholar a uh, fellowship to Berkeley, and I decided after I got out of the army, which interfered with everything, of course. Uh, I uh, decided just to pick up where I had been previously. Of course, the fellowship was gone by that time, but we had the GI Bill, which was, which was even better. And then, uh, like most graduate students, I uh, got a research assistantship and then a teaching assistantship. And uh, that, between that and making your wife go to work every day, you survive as a student. Right. Are, are, there, are there any experiences at Berkeley that you still recall? Any, any teachers that, that especially... Oh, there's you? no question that the experience uh, here... You, you want to remember that, uh, that uh, many of the students in that period had spent three, four, in some case five years in the Army. They came out of the Army. The campus was a place to get back into civil, civil, civilian life. And it was a place to sort of, uh, sort of reconstitute yourself. And uh, I was very fortunate. I was in the Department of Agricultural Economics. Uh, the atmosphere around Giannini Hall is very informal. It's, very, it's a close family. And uh, you, you, you just can't help but think back of those days, people like uh, Harry Wellman, Sid Hoos, the late Sid Hoos, who was a marvelous and whose research, assi research assistant I was, George Kuznets, who's still on the campus, Ivan Lee, uh, Murray Benedict, who passed away not too long ago. People like that uh, were an inspiration to, uh, to the returning uh, veterans. And uh, they brought us back into the academic world. It was, uh, it was the foundation for whatever future you found for yourself. In fact, on this campus, uh, by uh, I ought to also mention uh, Henry Vaux, uh, who was the chairman of my uh, doctoral committee and uh, under whom I did uh, my thesis work. I wrote a thesis on the economics of the California lumber industry. A great preparation for right. diplomacy, <laughs> I might say. As I'm fond of telling people, at least I learned how to tell the difference between the forest and the trees, which is important in diplomacy. In every field. <laughs> did yeah, you take any political science course? <laughs> I never took a political science course in my life. I'm sorry to say to a political scientist. No, I was trained in science and economics. But that's as good a training uh, as, uh, as any other, very frankly. Uh, it, the discipline that goes into science and economics is, uh, is useful in terms of uh, conditioning you to think. Uh, and of course, the accumulation of knowledge is, uh, is an equally important element of any education. Did, did you ever consider an academic career? Uh, I had considered it, uh, but uh, one day, uh, there was a recruiting team from the State Department came to the campus, spoke to the graduate students. They made it very clear that they were looking for people with a different background. They were sort of tired of the traditional political scientists, uh, international relations major, the, uh, the guy who went to Harvard, Yale, or Princeton, and the old uh, stereotype of the diplomat in striped pants uh, uh, was disappearing in that period. And they were looking for a, a wider uh, selection of uh, candidates for the career uh, diplomatic service. And uh, uh, several of us who were at the meeting decided to take the examination. In those days, it was a three-day written exam, including a language exam. It was not an easy examination. Uh, I was fortunate. I passed it, and I went on to an oral examination sometime later and was appointed. And that was the beginning. And that, that was really the, the, the heyday of American diplomacy in some sense. I mean, it was, well, it was an exciting period it, for you? The entire period since then has been an exciting period. After all, uh, when you look at international affairs and the role of the United States in the world, uh, the period from World War II to the present day, and I presume on into the future, is a period of the, mo of the, mo uh, the greatest uh, uh, American diplomatic activity in history. And uh, the United States emerged as uh, the superpower, and then uh, sharing uh, superpower uh, uh, rank, you might say. Uh, no question, but that uh, there was this was an, an a, a time for uh, diplomacy. It was also a time in which uh, international affairs became a constant preoccupation of. Uh, the American administration and the American pe people, no matter what administration and at what period in the post-war time. 
What, as you look back at, at your career, what, what diplomatic achievement are, are you proud of, <laughs> oh, that, well, that you were involved you know, in? Achievements are uh, not something one likes to talk about. If you, if you ask me what were the great failures that I was a uh, part of, I could tell you those too. Oh, there's no question that, uh, that from uh, my standpoint, I had a wide variety of assignments. I mean, everything from some routine matters to involvement in some of the most significant uh, uh, diplomatic problems of the day. Uh, I was involved in the Vietnam experience uh, at great length, including uh, three and a half years at the uh, peace talks in Paris. I was uh, uh, involved in uh, a wide range of uh, preliminary negotiations with respect to uh, the Middle East in the, uh, the mid-70s. Uh, of course, most recently, I came out of retirement and um, once again uh, uh, performed a function which uh, had some utility and in addition uh, gave me an opportunity to get back in the harness again. You know, you, uh, you're an old fire horse, you like to go to fires. And crises are the fires of diplomacy. And when you get into, when, the, when, when we get in, or when a crisis occurs, and somebody wants to call for a fireman, if you happen to be the one that they call on, there's a certain degree of satisfaction in that achievement, if you succeed. Uh, there's no question that, uh, that the Foreign Service is a career which uh, provides ample opportunity for uh, uh, exciting involvement. So, for any of the students who might want to consider diplomacy as a career, I, obviously I'm biased. I spent over 30 years at it, and uh, I don't think I ever, ever had a dull day, even when I was doing routine things. Because one characteristic of the di diplomatic service is if you don't like what you're doing, just wait a little time and you'll be assigned somewhere else or you'll do something else. Uh, the variety is amazingly uh, wide. Uh, if you're an economist, there's plenty of room for economic analysis and uh, expertise, and economic diplomacy is an important element of, uh, of our uh, foreign policy. If you're uh, interested in politics, there it is. If, you're an if you want to be an administrator, there's a, there are plenty of opportunities. Uh, it's a very human uh, profession in the sense that constant, you're constantly dealing with human beings and human problems and uh, social problems and I include in social problems, political problems. Uh, so that uh, uh, a career in the diplomatic service provides an opportunity not only to serve, but to serve with uh, fascination. That's important. It, it might be helpful for our audience to, to understand what a diplomat, uh, a peace negotiator does. Now, well, you, you, you've had not all diplomats are peace negotiators. Right, and, okay, uh, well let, let's... But all peace negotiators are diplomats. Uh. <laughs> Uh, you, 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 in the diplomatic service, you, you assume different roles. You've been an ambassador, you've, right. you've served at high levels in Washington, and then you, you've been uh, the, 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 uh, the fireman set out to put out the fires. L let's talk a little about those roles. Uh, an ambassador. Well, let's first of all take a look at uh, a diplomat. Uh, you know, the old, the old uh, canard that a diplomat is a man who is sent abroad to lie for his country is nonsense. And, and matter of fact, the most, uh, in my opinion, the most fundamental requirement of successful diplomacy is honesty. So that, that dismisses that old saying. Uh, secondly, uh, the function of the diplomat when he's, when he's exercising the responsibilities of the diplomat is to represent the views of his government, his nation. Because in this modern world, uh, it isn't sufficient to say that the diplomat is the representative of the sovereign to another sovereign. Uh, in the modern world, it's much more, it's much more, uh, 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 you have a much wider responsibility. In many ways, you represent the interests of your nation as well as the, the policies of the government which you may be serving at the moment. I've served in every administration since Harry Truman in one way or another, in more or less important posts. But in, in every respect, uh, what we were serving were the national interests of the United States uh, and in the broadest possible terms whether it was in terms of trade relations or political relations or the pursuit for peace, which is, of course, the overriding objective of American foreign policy. And uh, so that uh, 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 an embassy, for example, is the representation of American foreign policy interests abroad. 
The embassy sits uh, uh, with a diversity of activity. Uh, it, uh, it, it has an economic section, it has a political section, it has a consular section which deals with such mundane things as visas, passports, the protection of American citizens abroad. I mean, uh, uh, there is uh, obviously every, every organization has to be administered, so you have an administrative section. Uh, you have a public relations uh, or a public affairs uh, uh, section that deals with the presentation of American views and American culture. Uh, to the country which you're president. So that an embassy is a complex uh, organization designed to represent American views and the American uh, ethic, uh, and to some respect, the American culture uh, to the country in which, it is, uh, in which it's present. Now, uh, obviously, when you're abroad working in embassy, your functions are different than when you're in Washington participating in the headquarters operation, you might say. Now, when you're in Washington, basically, you're working uh, much more broadly in the field of foreign policy. Depending on what level of uh, uh, you, you're, you're working at, whether you're a junior officer sitting on a desk or you're an analyst in a research office uh, analyzing trends and events abroad, uh, or whether you're a, uh, uh, sufficiently, in a sufficiently senior position to be directing and uh, helping to formulate uh, foreign policy and directing its implementation. <coughs> I've done a little of everything. Uh, by good fortune, I had the opportunity to, to serve almost at every level in the department and well, equally almost at every level abroad. Uh, from the most junior officer in embassy to an ambassador, and from a junior analyst in the uh, research department of the, of, uh, of the research division of the Department of State to uh, Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs. So that and I've represented the United States in many uh, international meetings. Uh, so that uh, uh, the Washington uh, aspect of diplomacy is an entirely, uh, uh, of a diplomatic career, is, is it's, it's of course linked, but it's a, it, it, it requires a, a different sort of effort than when you're abroad. Uh, foreign policy uh, is formulated uh, in, in Washington. It's a, constitutionally the responsibility of the executive, of the president. Uh, the formulation of that policy takes place in the Washington environment of, of uh, uh, different departments, different points of view. Uh, it also uh, uh, serves in effect as the formulator for the Department of State and other departments serves as the formulator of policy for the president, presenting to him uh, uh, various options, uh, courses, possible courses of action in any particular situation, <coughs> uh, uh, set, le, le, setting forth for him the consequences of, uh, of action or not taking action in any given circumstance, uh, uh, so that he can then decide between alternatives or between options, as one might say. Now, once that's done, then you have to implement a decision. And the, the, the role of the State Department, as well as some of the other departments of government, uh, then uh, uh, sort of moves outward from the Washington scene to maybe multilateral international agencies, maybe bilateral relations with a given country, maybe to an alliance relationship or a council of, uh, of alliance relationships, uh, or uh, it may involve a specific negotiation for a specific purpose. Uh, all of this is the bread and butter of, uh, of uh, the conduct of foreign affairs. Uh, now, uh, a career diplomat, uh, obviously, uh, uh, has uh, one, uh, 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 one thing to look forward to, and that is that uh, he can serve through a succession of administrations. He's not partisan. Uh, the, uh, the, the proper term for uh, a career diplomat, who's a career bureaucrat, of course, there's nothing nasty about the word bureaucrat, despite uh, some people's attitude toward it, uh, is the, the, the key element is nonpartisanship. It isn't a question of being bipartisan, or, but nonpartisanship to serve the national interest through the mechanism of uh, the State Department in this case. Now, uh, uh, I found uh, no difficulty uh, from administration to administration. Uh, I've served in, in both Democratic and Republican administrations at a, at a fairly uh, senior position, uh, level. And, uh, uh, what we provide, what the career service provides, is 
uh, depth of knowledge, uh, continuity of, uh, of experience uh, with, uh, with issues, and uh, a certain familiarity with the outside world in which we've worked uh, usually by the time you get to a senior position, you've worked all your life in. You know the people, you know the, you know the, in many cases you're quite well aware of the cultural differences and, uh, and the historic uh, traditions of, of different cultures and different nations. All of that, as I say, is part of the bread and butter of diplomacy. Now, in, in recent times, some of these, these, these parts of the, the service have come under criticism. For example, uh, uh, the problem that we've had where uh, our embassy loses touch with the, the political situation in a, in a particular country. Uh, would you address yourself to that, that problem for well, a moment? You know, uh, perfection is not necessarily a common human trait. And there are occasions when uh, you're less than successful in your effort. Now, any embassy worth its salt uh, doesn't lose touch with anything. It may not sufficiently understand, or uh, its analysis may be faulty, or it may be uh, proceeding on insufficiency of facts, but that it would deliberately run out to be uh, incompetent uh, is, uh, I mean, it just doesn't, uh, things don't happen that way. Uh, but human beings are fallible. You can make errors of judgment. You can make errors of analysis. Uh, I would imagine even on this brilliant campus there are uh, analysts who make errors of analysis, and there are people who make errors of judgment. Now, of course, you would hope not to. You would hope for perfection. Uh, but uh, to expect it is, uh, is uh, desirable. To, uh, to get it is, uh, is sometimes rare. Uh, obviously, there have been cases where uh, the, uh, the capacity to, uh, to reach out into a society and understand it. it may not have been as complete as you want. But generally speaking, I, my own feeling is that if you look a little deeper, you'll find that uh, that was not the problem. The problem in, in, in our f uh, the conduct of our foreign affairs is very seldom lack of knowledge. Uh, we have an, an enormous capacity to gather information. We have an equally enormous capacity to analyze it. Then somebody has to make a judgment, and that's the critical point. I mean, there's, there's rarely a lack of information. What there usually is, if there's, if there's something less than success, either a situation which uh, altered, circumstances change, or somewhere along the line, uh, judgment uh, faltered. And uh, that, again, is a very human failing. Uh, I, it's not, I don't think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a question that uh, is, can be answered by saying, oh, well, it's the system. I don't think it's the system. And I don't think it's the people in the system. Not always. Sometimes you will get uh, a square peg in a round hole who doesn't have the kind of understanding or capacity to understand. But even then, there's so many layers of, uh, of uh, checks and analysis uh, at different layers, and uh, there's so much opportunity for, for th the reconsideration in, in, in foreign affairs, of the reconsideration of what you're doing and, what you, uh, and on what basis you're doing it, that I would argue uh, that, uh, by and large, we're well served by the system. The nation is well served by the system. Of course, I'm biased again. In, in Washington, uh, w when we're, we're talking about that part of America's foreign policy op apparatus, the, the, there, there is a, a criticism we hear that, that there's too much fragmentation. I mean, th there has been a sense uh, both from abroad, our allies commenting on uh, the situation, of course, from the media in this country, that, that, that uh, administrations in recent years uh, and I'm not singling out one or the other, have, have, have spoken with too many voices, and that this leads to, to, to a confusion. Would you like to comment on that? Well, that, there's, uh, a, there's a certain uh, diversity of opinion. That's very true. There's no question. I mean, uh, it would be very surprising in the American context if there weren't. After all, we're a wide open, pluralistic, uh, free speaking, uh, uh, free thinking society, and it's reflected in government. Uh, I, as a matter of fact, the contrast of ideas is well worthwhile. 
I think the conflict of views is well worthwhile. Now, the problem in diplomacy, of course, is when does conflict and diversity of view confuse, or when does it simply serve uh, better to, uh, to uh, provide for the people who have to make the decisions the widest possible uh, range of, of information? Now, I would argue that once the decision is made, then there should not be a diversity of views. That's, again, the way it should be. Now, there have been times when uh, the diversities of views have confused. There's no question about that. Different voices. But in addition, that, frankly, is not so much a problem with respect to administrations, also it has, although it has occurred in administrations. But the foreign policy process and foreign affairs now are dealt with on a much wider uh, scale. Uh, that is, uh, uh, in many uh, many more quarters have an input than uh, in, in, the, in the not too distant past. For example, you can't make, uh, you can't conduct a, uh, an effective foreign policy without in some way or another taking into account congressional uh, authorities and progress. If for no other reason, you have to go to Congress to get the money to conduct the policy. But in addition, uh, there has been uh, developed in this country a congressional interest in the process so that government officials come up and testify, they are queried, they are, they are they, the oversight of the Congress in the affairs of, uh, of, of, our, of our nation is uh, very pervasive. And that's as it should be. I don't find any trouble with that. I've appeared before congressional committees a thousand times if I've appeared once, and I never found it uh, something that, uh, w that it was necessary to avoid. They have also a responsibility. In addition, uh, foreign affairs today are subject to uh, uh, public opinion in a way which in the past also was not uh, common. That is to say, public opinion expressed either, of course, through their elected representatives in the Congress or through the media or through special interest groups or through the, uh, the normal or, uh, organizations that exist in a society like ours whether they're trade unions, uh, uh, academic associations, uh, uh, what have you. So that uh, the, uh, the examination of the process as well as the implementation, the process of formulation as well as the implementation of foreign policy is constant. This examination is constant and, uh, and uh, therefore, be, uh, given its, its wide range, it produces almost any possible uh, circumstance that you want to look for. But, but is, is there some difference in, in this later period of your career than an earlier period? I mean, in other words... Oh, there is a, to a certain extent, yes. Uh, when I came into the service uh, over 30 years ago, 33, 34 years ago, uh, the traditional authority of the executive was not as uh, uh, thoroughly examined as it mm -hmm. is today. But then again, I'm not so sure that's so bad. You know, uh, some people argue that, uh, uh, particularly some people argue in foreign, foreign affairs and security affairs, that uh, democracy is something less than perfect. But, you know, uh, you can go back to Winston mm -hmm. Churchill's dictum that uh, it's the worst of systems except it's better than everything else. Uh, right. <laughs> or that whatever. I don't know how I've paraphrased them accurately or inaccurately. That's actually a, a point that's often made. I, I'd like to explore that, namely that, that somehow our diplomats and our foreign service is at a disadvantage when it deals with, with the communist states. That's nonsense. I, I mean, I've seen the diplomatic services of every other, of not every other, but at least a, a good cross-section of, of, of nations in the world. I don't have any question at all that ours is recognizably the finest diplomatic service in the world. Uh, even the traditionally uh, uh, lauded British Foreign Service will agree with me, I'm sure, if you really put them to the test. It's, uh, the evidence of it frequently is when you're abroad, how often the diplomats of other countries come to us uh, for uh, uh, understanding of what's going on. Uh, now, in addition, I never found it uh, difficult to deal with authoritarian uh, regimes representing a democratic regime. On the contrary, I found it much easier. I felt much more at ease that uh, wh what I was representing was not the rep not, was generally not the views of uh, of a tight uh, small clique uh, 
but that uh, it was more broadly based. Because there's no question in my mind that American foreign policy has a very broad base because it represents a democratic society. Now, uh, that's one of the strengths of it. Uh, it is not difficult in this nation of ours uh, to uh, assess uh, what we stand for as a nation. And that's something that we translate into our foreign policy. There have been some changes in recent years, which are not all to the good, I might say. For example, I don't think there's any question that there's a certain degree, <coughs> pardon me, to a certain degree, there's a lack of confidence that the government knows what it's doing. <laughs> if mm -hmm. I, I, it's not so much that there's a lack of consensus about some of the things that are done, but that there, you know, this, this, is a, this is a more recent development, this lack of confidence that the government knows what it's doing, or the, 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 the wider spread questioning of, uh, that it knows what it's doing. Not of what it's doing, but that it knows what it's doing. Get the difference. Mm -hmm. now, I'm, I'm not talking about uh, consensus with respect to a subject. I'm talking about consensus with respect to a process, mm -hmm. to the function, to the role of government. I think we can come out of that. I think we have to come out of it. I don't see any reason why we have to suffer through that kind of uh, situation. And what, what, are, what are the uh, causes, do you think, oh, of that? Is no it the question. media, the, the, our experiences no, no, with I, the media? I think there was a certain, this is still a heritage of the 60s, of the events of the 60s and early 70s. And uh, I don't think there's any question of that. That was the beginning of it, and that was, that's the hangover. But uh, we'll come out of it. One, one of the, the things... In the mass, you know, the United States in the mass, Americans in the mass generally do the right thing. In the mass. Right. Generally do the right thing. What, what, one of the, 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 the cri criticisms, comments on, on U.S. foreign policy is, uh, that, that relates to the subject is, is this lack of a, of a consensus. Uh, there, now, is this just a romantic view that sometime in the past we were in total agreement about everything that we did and well, we no longer have that? I, I think there's certain romanticism about it, but uh, there's, not, uh, there's no question that, that for brief periods in our past we have had uh, great bipartisan foreign policy or nonpartisan foreign policy general agreement on overall methods and approaches and uh, a willingness, as I said earlier, to accept that the government knew how to do it. Uh, I think, by and large, in terms of, uh, of uh, substantial issues, it is still, uh, consensus is still widely achieved and achievable. Uh, there, is, uh, there is, for example, I don't think any doubt that there is a consensus in this country uh, at, the mom at this moment for example, that uh, uh, we should uh, realize that we face the fundamental foreign policy of our time being how do we manage our relations vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union and its allies in terms of the United States and, and its allies. That is, this question of competition, confrontation, whatever you want to call it, uh, uh, with the Soviet Union, is an overriding element. Now, equally true, I think, there is no doubt that there is a consensus in this country that the fundamental objective of the United States foreign policy must be peace and security. I think at the present time, there is a mood in this country which one could characterize to a certain extent as defense-oriented internationalism. There was the, the uh, when the administration came in, it came in on a crest of uh, uh, a feeling that uh, somehow or another uh, we had to devote a little more attention to the defense side of our uh, 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 governmental uh, machinery. Uh, now, I'm not saying that there is consensus as exactly how to do it. On the contrary, there's a diversity of opinion, whether you go this far or that far, but the general mood was, was and probably still is that. Now, what the debate is over is how do you achieve these broader objectives? For example, there's a debate going on right now with respect to uh, uh, the nuclear question. There's a debate going on right now uh, with respect to the priorities between different uh, uh, activities of government. Uh, but 
generally speaking, in the field of foreign affairs, uh, the United States, the people in the United States expect that A, the government will work for peace, B, the government will take all the measures necessary to provide for our and our allies' security, uh, that there's also a, a, a general feeling that uh, some way or another, we, we've got to find a way to, if not contain the Soviet Union in its expansionist policies, at least to find a way to better manage that competition or to manage it uh, uh, in a way that uh, serves our interests. And the, you could go through a whole series of given problems, and I think you could find consensus. For example, I don't think there's any lack of consensus in this country that the United States should be committed to the security and, and uh, preservation of Israel as a state. Now, how you do it, to, to, to what extent you may support or, or work uh, contrary to given actions, either of the administration or, in fact, that fact of the, uh, uh, the partners and other, the uh, participants in other countries, that's another question. That you can find differences of opinion on. And there are differences of opinion. There's no question. But with respect to the, to the basic uh, statement I made a while ago that there is a consensus in this country the United States should support its commit its long-standing commitment a commitment that goes through every administration since Truman that we would support the existence and the security of Israel now how to what extent in what terms at any given moment uh, those are subjects for discussion debate and reformulation but uh, the basic commitment is maintained I hear you having a, a very positive view. Oh, I'm very positive about most things, Harry. <laughs> I, if, you know, if you're a pessimist, you don't become a diplomat, because if, if you do, you, there's no way you're going to get ahead uh, with the problems, the dealing with the problems. Right. You've got to be optimistic about the most ridiculous and difficult of problems. But, but what I find very interesting in what you're saying is the, 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 your, 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 your really sort of posititive view of, of the way uh, democracies can have oh, foreign policy. Because this, this has been mind. quite an argument. Oh, but that's, namely an academic, that we, that's we, a bunch of academic nonsense. That gives people an opportunity to write something. You see, you can philosophize at the, at the inadequacies of democracy. And it's the difficulty when it faces uh, uh, authoritarian um, regimes where there's great continuity of foreign policy. Wait, well, you can have continuity in a lousy policy, or you can have change when change is necessary. Continuity is not necessarily the only thing you look for in a foreign policy. There is a degree of continuity in foreign policy. And there is in our administration. Mm -hmm. there's, no, there's no lack of continuity in the national interest of the United States from regime, from administration to administration. There may be differences in dealing with the, uh, with the, uh, in pursuing those interests. Uh, generally, they're, they're, they're not drastic differences. From time to time you get drastic differences. You get major changes in a policy with a change administration. But, but generally speaking, the continuity of interests remains and the method of dealing with them is not, uh, does not uh, sort of radically, is not radically altered. We're a dynamic society, however, and change is part of, of a dynamic society. And I would be, I would be uh, upset if all we had was rigidity. The characteristic of American, uh, of American thinking is pragmatism. If there's any American philosophy, as the philosophers have once told me, that it is that, that we have a pragmatic approach. We deal with uh, issues and problems in a way uh, uh, with openness and flexibility. And we take into account circumstances. And, and that the, the electoral process, the development of, of movements in this com country... Which That's not a bad way to bring you, about change. Right. If change, words, yeah. if change is to be brought about, what better way that it should be brought about by some manner of public debate and choice? What better way? Do you have to wait for somebody to die to bring about change? No. Not in a democratic system. You can vote him out of office if you don't like what he's doing. Or you can vote him into office if you like what he proposes. Do you... In, and that's one thing about foreign policy. It is a matter of constant debate in the American body politic. That was not always true. You know, foreign policy was usually, in, in, in the old days, many years ago, foreign policy was a preserve of a few. <coughs> it was, you know, them foreigners that we were dealing with. <coughs> Nowadays, them foreigners are us in many respects. And we, uh, uh, there is a, uh, there, foreign policy is not the preserve of an elite. Just like the diplomatic service is not the preserve of the elite. And that's an important point. The diplomatic service of the United States represents the broadest possible cross-section of American 
uh, strength and youth and uh, uh, intelligence. Uh, some years ago, uh, I was asked by the Secretary of State to chair a committee, coming back to the diplomatic service, to chair a committee to review the recruitment and the examination of candidates for the career service. And <clears throat> I put together a committee, a very broad uh, committee of uh, professionals, and then we uh, drew, uh, we, we called witnesses from all sorts of uh, relevant organizations and uh, points of view and departments, I might say, and we, uh, we considered uh, the desirability, for example, of uh, uh, and the role of an affirmative action program. We considered the desirability and role of, uh, <coughs> of uh, 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 the examination procedures themselves, how well they, they were serving our purposes in producing the kind of people we wanted. The recruitment procedure has to pr produce the kind of candidates you want. The examination procedure has to give you a way of selecting the best of the candidates. We still were getting, are still are getting between 10 and 15,000 applicants every year mm -hmm. for the Foreign Service. And we choose, depending on the budgetary requirements, anywhere between 100 and 250 in any one year. And that gives you a wide uh, opportunity to choose very, very, uh, <coughs> from a wide uh, spectrum of, uh, of candidacies. Now, uh, that committee that I chaired came to the conclusion that uh, the, both the recruitment and the examination procedures should seek to tap the widest possible range of American talent. That it was not designed to produce an elite out of an elite, uh, say, university structure. That it was worthwhile to reach out uh, all across the country. Uh, that uh, what you wanted was, uh, uh, what you wanted was a, a, a process which would allow you to draw on the multitude, multitude of strengths of the American uh, nation and, uh, and including uh, its, uh, its various elements, whether uh, in terms of uh, male-female or whether in terms of ethnic origin and, uh, and whether in terms of, uh, of um, uh, relative affluence. Do you, do you have trouble explaining this system to the, the, the foreign nationals that you deal with in diplomacy? I mean, is no, it... No, most, uh, most, uh, uh, most of them know us quite well. So the people you deal with in international diplomacy generally are fairly sophisticated about the world, in most cases. Mm -hmm. Now, there are some new nations that come on the scene where they haven't had a tradition of involvement in foreign affairs, but that period is now passing. Uh, most nations in the world now have a, a, a core of, uh, of uh, informed individuals who know a great deal about the world. And in most cases, most of them know a great deal about the United States. Either they served at the UN and have seen it in action, or they've actually served in Washington, or they've, uh, they may have studied in Washington, or they've, they've had contact with the, uh, the American scene. We're a very pervasive culture in the world today, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, even to a certain extent uh, behind the Iron Curtain. Uh, within the Soviet bloc, uh, there are uh, institutions of study of, of, uh, of the United States that are, that are very, uh, they're, they're well-staffed, and they, uh, they play a very important role in producing the kind of analysis and understanding of the United States that is necessary for them to make their choices. As a matter of fact, that's a good thing. You wouldn't want them to. <coughs> you wouldn't want them to stumble by making a mistake, either as to our purpose or our strength or our determination. And what, what about the other side of that equation? That is American understanding of the world oh, and of different yeah. of different well, peoples. I, l let's. You know let's that old business that we don't know, understand the world. That's nonsense. You know we, uh, the uh, for the last forty or fifty years, the United States has been a part of the outside world in a way that goes beyond uh, any previous experience of any nation in many ways. Uh, uh, <coughs> we've, got, uh, we've got people, uh, uh, a, a large group of people who have lived, studied uh, abroad, or who have spent some time uh, in, uh, in trying to understand uh, uh, 
uh, other, other cultures and other peoples. We have very, uh, in, we have in depth, for example, in the State Department, <coughs> people who uh, speak uh, dozens of uh, obscure languages and uh, who have lived uh, all over the world, <coughs> who have uh, devoted uh, not just a few years, but a lifetime of study of given cultures. <coughs> now, th we, we both specialize and we generalize in this regard. Uh, the, uh, and then we have to draw on, and do draw on at various times, uh, the academic community, uh, the, the, the media, <coughs> the various interest groups. For example, when I was Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs, I had a, an advisory committee that met sometimes three or four times a year. And uh, it, uh, it consisted uh, of uh, people from uh, those various communities who uh, we would clear so they could come in, we would present our problems to them, and say, this is what we're working on, this is what we're thinking, what do you think? We would try to produce, uh, we would try to produce for these meetings those, that expertise which would supplement our own expertise. Now, if we wanted to be arrogant, we could have said, oh, we don't need them, we know all that we need to know. But you never know all that you need to know. So as a result, we had, I had this committee in which for three days we would sit in a very quiet place, sometimes in Washington, sometimes out of Washington, and review what we were doing and get something out of them. Matter of fact, one of the professors from this campus was a member of that committee. Professor Scalapino was a member of that advisory group. Uh, he's a, 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 an internationally uh, respected uh, authority on East Asia, and uh, I can assure you that uh, his, his thoughts were considered very carefully, as were the thoughts of all the others. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, the fact that we, uh, that we send our, our uh, professionals out into the American uh, uh, university system, either as students or as diplomats in residence, students in an in-training, in an uh, in-service training program, or as professionals, uh, as diplomats in residence, or just as speech makers. The fact that we do that, uh, in the case that we're trying to tap the, the larger pool of knowledge of uh, what's going on in the world that exists in, this, in, in, in the university system, and uh, uh, that has, I think, served very well uh, to, uh, uh, to increase our understanding. If you take an issue like human rights, for example, is there uh, some frustration in, 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 in reaching a situation where the American people understand really the limits of what we can do in, 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 in countries that may be authoritarian but are our allies, who we would like to see move in a direction uh, more compatible with our values, but that in the present situation that, that's hard to achieve? Well, that's a question. Emphasis in that regard shifts and has shifted. Uh, that's well known, say, between the previous administration and the present administration. But that does not mean that the present administration has abandoned the, the, the consideration that human rights is something that the United States must take an interest in. Uh, I don't think any administration can abandon a concern over that because the American people want to stand for something. And the administration has, has to represent what the American people stand for. And there's no question that the American people do, do not stand for repression, brutality, torture, you name it. Uh, we have a concept. Now, on the other hand, uh, the manner in which one pursues uh, uh, the dedication to that uh, uh, tactically at any given moment and, uh, uh, and what differentiation you may make between uh, immediate interests, longer term interests, strategic interests versus uh, 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 interests of, uh, of, uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of a principal importance in our, uh, in our general outlook, that's different. Uh, and there, uh, things do shift, and they and they and they shift uh, uh, possibly understandably. Uh, but I think at the at the foundation of it, there's no doubt in my mind that a concern for human rights is a uh, is not an eradicable element of American foreign policy, and that's already been demonstrated by 
what this administration has had to say about it when people accused it of having abandoned human rights. The administration refused to accept that it had abandoned it uh, as, a, as, a, as an element of policy. Now, what degree of priority you may attach in a particular circumstance, that's, that's debatable. But it's, it's, a, it's part of the core element of American foreign policy, and I think it will continue to be so. One, one of the roles that, that a diplomat uh, serves that, that we really didn't get into earlier, which I'd like to pursue with you, is the, the, this, this, this role in a crisis. And in, for example, the, 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 the crisis of 81, the Lebanon crisis, which you resolved, uh, what, what are the, the, the characteristics of a diplomat uh, acting in a crisis situation like that where we're on the brink in essence I mean not the nuclear brink well, uh, what 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 beside hard work which clearly is is a is a description that was used uh, about you again and again in the press what what are some of the the other characteristics uh, well quite of an obviously uh, crises uh, crises at the present time are endemic in the world we live in they're recurrent uh, one week it's, uh, it's the uh, Lebanese situation or the Lebanese-Israeli situation. Another week it's, or another month or another year, it's the Falkland Islands. Another day it'll be uh, an incident uh, somewhere, somehow, involving either the United States or United States interests, which therefore recall, call for some degree of crisis management on the part of the United States. Now, first of all, you have to decide what it is whether, what it is you want to do, whether you want to do something about it or you don't want to do something about it. Now, there is a mechanism in Washington for the examination of crisis, crises as they arise and for the management of crises, for the determination of what our position should be and what we should do. Now, f so that once that mechanism is, has, uh, has performed its function, and that usually doesn't take very long because if it's a crisis, you've got to get right onto it, by definition, then you have to decide the, me the, 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 the mechanics, the methods. All right, now, that usually involves some degree, if it's a crisis, of uh, negotiation, mediation, whether it's uh, sending somebody like me out to, uh, to treat with the parties uh, at issue, uh, or whether it's uh, the Secretary of State uh, going between uh, the United Kingdom and, and Argentina with respect to the Falklands dispute. Uh, this, uh, uh, the first thing it requires, of course, to come back to your specific question, which is always useful to address the specific question. <laughs> uh, the first thing you've got to uh, uh, presume, and which is often true, is that somehow the United States uh, frequently can play a unique role Despite all you may hear about what the world thinks of us, nations frequently turn to the United States because they know that the United States will bring a certain uh, philosophy to the solution of crises. That generally speaking, we will move in a direction that if it's a, if it's a crisis, crisis that threatens conflict, that we will generally speaking seek to find a way to mediate conflict, to avoid conflict, to mediate confrontation, to avoid conflict, I should say. Uh, we have a, there's a, there's a certain acceptability of our skills and our persuasive ability. There's also a recognition of our power and our strength, which frequently have to come into play. Then, of course, we have relations with a wide range of people at different levels, so that there again, there are associations and relationships which form the basis of the mediator's tools. Then the mediator has to have authority. Washington has to give him the, the authority. The, the administration has to give him the authority. The president has to lay his hands on, in other words. Now, for example, when I went to the Middle East uh, last year uh, in a succession of uh, visits to try to uh, defuse a situation which had all the earmarks of escalating into major conflict, I was uh, given uh, uh, sufficient authority by the administration to conduct myself, conduct the negotiations, uh, uh, without constant uh, reference for new instructions or 
Uh, in other words, you have to give, the administrator has to place its confidence. It's got to tell you what it wants, and let, then it should let the negotiator do what is necessary. And I must say that in, in, in the case of my personal experience, that was, uh, that was true. Now, other administrations have done the same thing, usually. Now, there have been times when the strings are too tight, but that depends on the circumstances. In any event, I believe that once the negotiator is told what he is to do, he should be left to find his way of doing it because he sees the whites of the eyes, so to speak, of the interlocutors. He knows whether to press in this direction or that direction, provided that he always stays within the general uh, uh, limits of, uh, of his instructions. A negotiator who exceeds his instructions is going to be repudiated by his home government. There's nothing worse than being repudiated by your, by your home government. Uh, you lose all credibility then. You might as well pack up and go home. Uh, now, the other thing is, of course, uh, it depends what role you're playing in a crisis. If you're involved in the crisis, that's a different matter. Mm -hmm. Then you may seek to negotiate it yourself. But if you're playing the role of mediator in a crisis, that again is a different matter. So there's, there's different degrees of crisis management. I mean, it's a crisis if, uh, if uh, uh, someone attacks an American ship or aircraft abroad, but that's a crisis that involves us directly. But it is also a crisis uh, when uh, Britain and Argentina get in the kind of uh, dispute they have over the Falklands, but it's a crisis which is of great interest to us and and affects our interest in a way so visible uh, that we immediately begin to seek uh, a, a solution uh, that serves uh, the mutual interest. No, no crisis will be resolved unless uh, there's a degree of restraint, there's a degree of understanding and agreement, and there usually has to be a degree of compromise. Uh, negotiations cannot be assumed on the basis of preconditions and be successful. Generally speaking, uh, preconditions have to be set aside in a negotiation, and then you begin to deal with the possible and uh, the areas of common ground. Uh, generally speaking, you'll always try to establish an area of common ground so that you could appeal to the same argument in each, uh, to each side. I mean, I can go on. I mean, but, but it, these, it, are the, yeah. these are the tools of, of crisis negotiation. Uh, for, of course, you have to have access. If you don't have access, you can't deal if you're the mediator. Now, uh, generally speaking, we will have access in most cases. We, we had access, in the case of the Middle East, uh, as a negotiator, I had access to the, to the important uh, interlocutors on uh, uh, various sides who were able to assist uh, in the direction in which we eventually went. As in, we eventually went in the direction of a ceasefire. Uh, cessation of, of, of hostile military activity as it was clearly defined. Uh, it was done uh, uh, sometimes uh, uh, in crisis situations you can't get formal written agreement. You have to get understandings. You might even have to have a little ambiguity. But all of those are the tools of diplomacy. Uh, they are the traditional tools of diplomacy. Uh, and every professional diplomat knows how to use them. It's the value of professionalism. Uh, not just simply career men. There are a lot of professionalism. There's a lot of professionalism in diplomacy that is not simply careerist. Uh, and uh, uh, these, uh, the, the, these tools uh, that are so important in, uh, in uh, crisis management, uh, just con they, they're, they're a concentration of what, you, what is normally part of the diplomatic process. Uh, they just happen to be con concentrated in a, in a tighter time frame and generally with respect to a very specific problem rather than in terms of broad foreign policy issues.
would say. You know, Dr. Kissinger uh, 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 sort of began the, uh, the, the type of shuttle diplomacy. See, Benjamin Franklin uh, uh, didn't have airplanes, uh, our first great diplomat. Uh, communication was much more difficult. Uh, today, uh, I mean, shuttle diplomacy is made possible by the state of the art of uh, transportation and communication. So that if I'm sitting in, uh, in Damascus or in Amman or in Jerusalem or in Beirut, I can pick up a telephone and call Washington on a secure line that nobody can listen to except the person I want to listen to and uh, discuss what I'm doing. Or uh, I can uh, move from one country to another to a third country all within one day flying hundreds of miles, or within one night for that matter. Uh, this capacity to, to move and to communicate uh, f uh, sort of uh, promotes uh, that kind of diplomatic activity. But I think that there's a limit to its use usefulness. It, uh, it really doesn't take the place of uh, uh, diplomacy in a more uh, traditional, uh, at a more traditional pace in terms of the great issues of the day. The shuttle diplomacy doesn't solve the problem of nuclear arms uh, reduction or limitation. A shuttle diplomacy doesn't produce a law of the sea. Shuttle diplomacy doesn't uh, 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 resolve issues of uh, uh, resource transfer and technology transfer, uh, which are important great diplomatic issues in the modern world. On the other hand, uh, it's very useful. It's very useful that, for example, when I was in the Middle East, what I, what I did is I flew commercial to Europe, picked up an Air Force jet out of Germany, which then stayed with me uh, from country to country so that I could call up and say, I want to leave in half an hour to go to country X when I'm in country Y, because I want to see somebody in country X to talk to him about what I heard in country Y, and I want to nail it down. And I don't want to wait because the guns are cocked. Or you have a meeting at uh, 11 o'clock at night with a, with a principal actor, and, he, and you get somewhere that's very substantial, so you don't wait a week or a day or you don't wait an hour. You go for the meeting right at the airport, 3 o'clock in the morning, you're flying to another country, you arrive at 7 o'clock morning, meanwhile you've communicated that you want a meeting with Prime Minister X or President Y and uh, uh, the meeting is arranged because he knows that you're coming with something significant. You've told him that. You walk in, you go from the airport right to the, the meeting, you lay it on the line and then you move on to another place. This happens constantly in this kind of thing. Now, it is possible it's not the most comfortable type of diplomacy, but in certain circumstances, it's the most effective. You, you said that this was a very human relationship. Does, 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 in these very tense moments, does humor ever enter oh, into... Oh, of uh, course. Uh, could, you, could you cite an example oh, of it? Humor is, humor is a great uh, tool of the diplomat. Uh, I suppose of all the diplomats I have personally worked with, uh, are the, the one that, uh, who had this greatest capacity to interject a note of humor at a critical moment was Henry Kissinger, uh, a great wit in many respects. And uh, he, he was even witty in foreign, in, through interpreters, and that's difficult. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but he had, in a tense moment, he had a capacity of saying something. Well, it's a tool that most of us try to use. I use it uh, quite frequently. Uh, oh, I don't know. Uh, there are anecdotes one can tell. Uh, one anecdote which one of my colleagues is, uh, is uh, fond of is uh, at one time uh, uh, in my discussions with, uh, with Mr. Bacon, I, I came to a point where we, we, were, we were really not, uh, we were not on the same line. We were, as is usual, we were debating the issues in perfect honesty. And I, there was not, nothing, when, I don't want to denigrate the, 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 the necessity of debate in negotiation. You have to have differences which you tend to try to narrow. But it had gotten a little tense, so, uh, so I looked over at him and I said, uh, well, Mr. Begin, Mr. Prime Minister, I, uh, there, you're sitting there, you have, uh, uh, you have uh, with you uh, 
Mr. Shemir, the foreign minister. You've got uh, the secretary general of the foreign ministry, Mr. Kimke. You've got uh, my dear friend Baron, uh, the deputy secretary general. You've got your good right hand man, Kadeshe, over there. I said, you know, uh, there you sit uh, with all that talent. And here am I. I said, I've got uh, Sam Lewis, the ambassador, and I've got Bill Brown, and I've got Mars Draper. I said, yo, Mr. Prime Minister, I'm surrounded by wasps. I've got to get a few people who talk with their hands. <laughs> And uh, he laughed, he says, wasp, he said, I know what that is. <laughs> and we laughed because the fact that I am quite clearly not a wasp, but his colleagues are not clearly not wasps, and that we talk with our hands uh, is part of the relationship. Well, it breaks the ice. Uh, it's part of that human relationship. And you combine it with a little bit of humor and uh, it moves things along. But, uh, but he, he, uh, he found that a, a rather enjoyable moment, and it uh, turns discussion around. And, and this is, this of course, is I didn't really mean it. I love Sam. I couldn't want any better team than <laughs> Sam Lewis, Mars Draper, Bill Brown. But uh, to make a point, you, uh, you you do things like that. And and this 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 uh, this this route to humor and and the human element is, is something that really crosses cultures. I mean, uh, in other there's words, no question. Yeah. I don't know of any culture that doesn't have humor. Now, mm -hmm. some of them are difficult to tap. Some people argue that it's very difficult to tell an American joke, say, to an Asian, to a Japanese or a Korean. But that isn't always true. I've seen Japanese convulsive laughter over a good American joke, one that's understandable. Mm -hmm. I've seen the same thing with Chinese. Chinese are very, very uh, witty, and they have uh, a sardonic sense of humor sometimes, which is very good. It used to go very well with the Kissingerian approach, I might say, when we used to. When, when I used to go to China with Secretary Kissinger, we would negotiate. Uh, uh, they, there, were, there were moments of, of substantial laughter on both sides, uh, which, as I said, it's one of the tools. It doesn't replace anything in diplomacy. It's a tool. One of the things that, that in, in, in human conflict, I think, there, that people often sort of misunderstand when you have a conflict of interest and then the extent to which the human element enters into the conflict and this, this, this role of, of shuttle diplomat flying between uh, capitals that are ready to go to war it seems to be, as, as you're describing it, a, a sort of a, a, a beautiful bridge of that gap. In other words, well, these, peoples are, th th these peoples are divided over very important issues, but at, at the same time, you as a, a, a shuttle diplomat really have to tap human elements to help bridge that, well, that the interest function, gap. The function of yeah. mediation is to narrow gaps and then bridge them. First, you have to narrow them. Sometimes they're so wide that you can't build a bridge that wide. You have to narrow them to look to that common ground. Common, a, a common phrase in diplomacy is to find the common ground. A f common phrase is to bridge the gap. A common phrase is to narrow the differences. A common phrase is to find uh, the mutual interest. Where does the mutual interest lie? How do you find it? How do you define it? How do you persuade uh, diverse views to reach uh, that final point of, if not agreement, at least understanding, if not form formal uh, uh, acceptance, at least uh, a willingness to state a condition, so that uh, by a condition I mean a fact, not a uh, not a uh, uh, prelude, so that. Uh, the, the kind of diplomacy you're, you've raised and we're talking about is a uh, is a it's a sort of the it's the sexy modern diploma, uh, diplomacy. It's the sort of thing that captures the headlines, uh, but it is not the foundation mm -hmm. of the basic relations between nations. It is not the foundation of of some sort of uh, uh, strategic understanding. It is not uh, a, a long term uh, uh, proposition. Uh, so, uh, uh, generally speaking, it will only be the part of any diplomat's life at a very brief moment. Uh, uh, it's, it's not something that uh, you, uh, you train for. It's something that you, uh, uh, that you, uh, that you learn. Did, as part of the process. Did, did your background in New York uh, oh, help prepare you in, in terms of the, the dealing with e different ethnic groups? Or? Well, uh, yeah, there's a certain empathy. You understand ethnicity, but, uh, uh, you know, the melting pot uh, 
is very substantial, especially for people like myself who are the youngest of an, uh, a, a member of an Im of a, of a uh, immigrant family, uh, uh, educated broadly across the whole length of the country, uh, uh, so that you, uh, you, you don't, ethni eth ethnicity or ethnic empathy is a useful thing. It, it's useful to understand ethnicity, but you don't have to be part of it in order to understand it. You can understand it intellectually. It's easier if you're part of it, no question about that. There's no question that uh, that uh, uh, you, you, your formative years leave you with certain uh, attributes. I mean, uh, and I spent my formative years in a melting pot, in one uh, which uh, uh, was a very vociferous one. I mean, the New York melting pot is very vociferous, uh, intellectually and uh, and uh, practically in every term. You, you, you posed a, an interesting problem in your distinction between crisis diplomacy and, and the sort of long-term hard negotiations. There, there's several examples in recent American history of the diplomats doing the work, engaging over a number of years in serious hard bargaining, some kind of, of treaty emerging, law of the sea, the salt, and then it, it gets... Uh, uh, it doesn't make the last hurdle. It's either turned back by a new administration or there's not ratification or whatnot. What, what, do, you, what do you see the outcome there? I mean, do you think... That happens. It, you know. That happens. Circumstances sometime uh, after the most horrendous and heart-rending negotiation, you produce a result which somehow or another does not result, if you know what I mean. It doesn't reach the stage of the final stage. Uh, the SALT II Treaty is an example. Uh, it's also possible that you uh, will produce something which you think fits the circumstances, has, provides an agreement which serves the general purpose, the general interest, but then circumstances change and there's nothing you can do to make it effective. Frequently, treaties and agreements are not self-enforcing. And therefore, some treaties are. Some treaties are self-enforcing. And they can be so written. Some are not. And if they're not, then it depends upon the circumstances subsequent to the negotiation. The classic example of that in our lifetime is, of course, the Vietnam uh, Peace Agreement. That was not a self-enforcing agreement. And in effect, uh, uh, it depended upon uh, certain attitudes and reactions on the part of the parties to it. And I might say that uh, uh, not only uh, uh, was, were, were those uh, uh, dependencies not uh, 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 evident uh, uh, on the other side, but uh, to a certain extent, uh, circumstances changed in Washington to a point to where uh, the capacity to, uh, to support the treaty mechanism, uh, uh, the treaty uh, uh, agreement, uh, the, uh, the agreements in the treaty, uh, disappeared. And uh, uh, in the end, uh, what was uh, uh, quite a good effort came to naught. Do you think that, that th this... As an effort as a negotiation. Now that was a protracted negotiation over years. Mm -hmm. uh, it took a good piece out of, uh, out of my, uh, my time, but uh, uh, even that uh, is not... Uh, the length of the negotiation, the intensity of the negotiation, is no assurance that it will, either that it will succeed, or b that its results will be uh, uh, as they were expected to be. Do you do you think that this this failure of, of many of these recent treaties to be consummated, either because of, of our failure or failure on the other side, did that that has any long term implications, or well, people, people it, just accept no, it? that has yeah, long term. For yeah. example, uh, I I think that. Uh, that in the case of the Law of the Sea, for example, which was carefully negotiated over a long period of time by the previous administration, over the representatives of the previous administration, the new administration comes in and says, look, we want the whole thing to be renegotiated. We don't, we don't accept what had been accepted previously by the previous regime. Now, that's a shattering thing in international relations because normally one expects in, in foreign affairs that the commitments of one administration or one regime or one sovereign, if there is a peaceful transfer of power, 
as there is in a democracy or in a constitutional monarchy or what, uh, or in a parliamentary system, that the uh, uh, commitments of one will be accepted by the following. That's a tradition. It is a tradition that is not always followed, however. There's no rule that says that has to be. And in this case, uh, the, the, administration, the incoming administration uh, had uh, in, uh, criticized the previous agreement in its electoral campaign. Therefore, it felt it had a right, when it took office, to put into effect its criticism, which is to say, we don't like certain uh, uh, parts of that treaty. We want to renegotiate them. Now, the, the, the nations of the world who are part of the negotiation, they don't have to accept that. They can say, no, uh, uh, okay, you want to talk about it some more, we're willing to talk, but, we're, we're, but that's what we want. We're not going to change our position. We have all agreed. You're the only one who hasn't agreed. And that's the situation in New York at the present time. Now, are we going to be able to persuade uh, the other nations of the world to change their views, to meet our perceived interest? Or are they going to go ahead without us? What happens if they do? What will be our position then? All of this is uh, still up for grabs. In, in looking back at your career, uh, is there one particular negotiator, uh, a diplomat that you've uh, 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 dealt with who, who stands out as preeminent? Well, all negotiators are different. There's no question. In, my, in modern times, the people that I've sat with, uh, people like Gabriel Harriman, uh, Henry Kissinger, Cyrus uh, Vance, uh, David Bruce, uh, uh, Dean Rusk, uh, uh, and of course I have been present when presidents have negotiated, but let's not talk about presidents, let's talk about diplomats uh, per se. Uh, people occupied constantly with diplomacy. Uh, I, uh, they're all different. They're all different. They all have different strengths and different weaknesses. Uh, 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 Cyrus Vance, for example, is a man who, with whom I hold the highest regard, both as a person and a, and a negotiator. His absolute and total and complete honesty was always transmitted to the people he worked with. He's probably the finest public servant I ever worked with. I ever worked. Now, that, there may be others that, are, that have a difference of opinion, but as a human being, uh, totally trusted by all the people we deal with, no matter which side they were on, that, that sheer uh, uh, s sincere uh, honesty that he, that, that was part of his nature, in fact, always came through. On the other hand, the capacity of Henry Kissinger to put things together, to conceptualize, to articulate, to move, to, to, to suggest uh, the, the value of the ambiguity or to or to produce the precise word at the right time is a marvelous thing to observe. The capacity of an Avery Harriman to understand the other guy's point of view, uh, the very human nature and the very relaxed sort of, but yet very tough inner resiliency of a David Bruce. David Bruce was a very relaxed gentleman, but there was a mind like a steel trap, and he knew how to bring things around. All of them had different qualities that uh, that those of us who worked with them respected, appreciated, and uh, learned something from, uh, in fact, very, very frankly. And I could mention others. I hope I haven't left anybody out that, uh, that, uh, that is, uh, that's important. But uh, uh, Ellsworth Bunker, for example, a distinguished, uh, a man of, uh, of great presence, uh, whom you instinctively respected. Uh, Henry Cabot Lodge, a man who had a touch for the political, a capacity to know the politics of a negotiation, because he was a he was fundamentally a politician and a good one, uh, despite the fact that he didn't he wasn't elected when he ran for vice president. That uh, that capacity uh, that he had learned running for the Senate and at the feet of his grandfather, so to speak, uh, that sort of thing was was very useful. He. Uh, uh, there were certain, certain negotiators who had a tremendous capacity of dealing with the press, dealing with the media. There were others who were not very good at it. Uh, political leadership usually wants to deal with the media. My approach to career professional leadership is that you, that you don't uh, run your negotiations in the media uh, because we, we serve a different function. Uh, the, uh, public relations is not necessarily a part of the careerist diplomacy 
Uh, and there are times when you don't want to use it. Now, there are other times when you use it. Let's face it. Uh, you need to say things at the right time, but there are times when you, don't, you need to say nothing. Uh, I'm sort of uh, notorious for being uh, the one who says, uh, who says nothing at great length. I hope I haven't done that today, Harry. Oh, no. But in any event, uh, uh, last year when we were in the Middle East, and again in the fall, and again this spring when I went back at different moments of apparent crisis, uh, I deliberately made the choice that I was not going to negotiate in the public. And therefore, I did not give interviews on background or on foreground, you might, or on the record. Uh, how you use the press is a part of diplomacy today. Uh, the background interview, for example, or the statement made by, quote, a senior official accompanying the Secretary of State, end quote, who was usually the Secretary of State himself, if you know the the meaning of the words uh, in, in a lot of the shuttle diplomacy. So that uh, there are different ways to deal with different situations. Uh, there, when we were in the Vietnam uh, peace negotiations, for example, we used to walk out of the meeting, walk over to the television cameras, state our point of view, and walk away. I mean, uh, that was part of the routine. The other side did the same thing. Because there was part of that negotiation was an appeal to public opinion. So you did it. I mean, there were periods, well, there was a period of about nine months when I was uh, in charge of the delegation in, uh, in, uh, in Paris, uh, uh, where I, uh, I was on live television uh, about, uh, about two or three times a week. There were periods when, uh, when uh, the other uh, members of the delegation, uh, the leaders of the delegation, uh, would be on two or three times a week, and one had to provide uh, the grist for that mill. Well, you do it. As, as everyone out there is listening to you, I, I have a feeling that they have a feeling that I have, which is when are your memoirs going to come out? Oh, but you, no. have, you have very strong feelings about that, well, don't I, you? Uh, yes, I don't uh, believe a careerist like myself needs to write his memoirs. Uh, my, uh, I'm sort of uh, in, the, in the, I take the point of view that Dean Rust takes in this regard. The things that I worked with are in the record. Uh, they'll be available one way or another to anybody at some time or another. Uh, m many memoirs, not all, many memoirs are sort of a justification of, of what you've done or how wise you've been and, uh, uh, or if, it's, if you've dealt with a controversial issue, a defense of what you've done. Uh, I don't have any records, any personal files. I don't have a diary. I don't have any transcripts. I, all whatever files I ever accumulated in my lifetime are in the State Department files in Washington. I have no personal, the only personal file I have is a clipping file, which is not a basis of memoirs, I might say, uh, which somebody gave, uh, did for me most of the time. Uh, so that uh, I would have to spend a, a great deal of time in Washington going through the files to, re to relive, uh, and even uh, to relive the days uh, of my own experiences, but even then you, you don't have that uh, sort of, uh, <laughs> the sort of thing that looked for in memoirs today, the verbatim, the verbatim records of what was said by whom at one occasion. I just don't have it. And uh, besides which, I, uh, I would rather leave uh, memoir writing to, to the political leadership rather. I think it's, if some of them want to do it, they do it. I think, for example, Henry Kissinger's memoir are fascinating. They're the things that they're, and the parts of it that I am familiar with are accurate. I can tell you that. Historically, he's a, he's a trained historian, and, and his, his records are voluminous. Voluminous. He's got every, practically every word that was ever said by whom on what occasion. Because there used to be an effort to, to keep the transcripts and to make the transcripts uh, at the time of conversations. Uh, so that uh, the raw material uh, is, is there. Besides which, uh, you know, when you're a minor actor in a great drama, uh, there's no reason, and, and I was, generally speaking, a minor actor in, in the great drama of the last 15 years or so, particularly. Uh, who the hell wants to know? Who wants to know your views? Uh, let the principal actors, let the record, let the historian who will have available to them all of these things, all of the papers emerge eventually, all the cables, all the reports, all the memoranda, all of the action memoranda, all of the decision memoranda, sooner or later become available, either under Freedom of Information Act or in the normal 
publication of the historical documents of the United States, and they'll all be there. One final question, Ambassador Habib. Uh, as you look down the road, uh, you see a, a United States probably whose, whose power is more limited than it was in, in, in an earlier period. Uh, you, we, we can see a, a Soviet Union that has more power than it did, but clearly we're still going to be very important in the world. W would you like to, to give us your reflections on, on uh, what you see America's role in the future, how it might be evolving, uh, and so on? Well, uh, it's, you're quite right. Uh, we, we live with the world. We don't dominate it any longer. If we ever were omnipotent and omniscient, uh, I think it would be fair to say that today we are not omnipotent, nor are we omniscient. There may have been a few years when that looked like reality, and there are some people that have a nostalgia for those days. But we live in a terribly complex and a terribly dangerous world. The, uh, I have no doubt that we have the capacity to deal with the complexity and with the danger. I think so long as we stay true to our own traditions, I think so long as we maintain as the basic thrust of our foreign policy uh, the twin objectives of peace and security, uh, I think that we will uh, succeed in maintaining both the peace and security of ourselves and uh, our allies and globally. Uh, the great issues, as I said earlier, of uh, today uh, revolve around the relationship between the United States and its allies and uh, the Soviet Union and its allies. These are the great issues of foreign policy today. Somehow or another, we have to deal with the question of military balance if we're going to have security. Somehow or another, we have to deal with the question of how do we manage our relations with the Soviet Union. Somehow or another, we have to deal with the, 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 with the various geopolitical problems that exist around the world, regional disputes, uh, 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 maintenance of alliances, uh, 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 bilateral disputes. These geopolitic, this geopolitical equation must be dealt with. And then finally, we have to deal with the issues in foreign affairs in the future that uh, relate to the process of change and the desire of maintaining and sustaining independence in the third world and non-allied countries. That, that means that we have to devote resources to their development, to their process, to their progress. I think that uh, this relationship uh, of uh, the transfer of, uh, of, uh, of technology, the transfer of uh, financial resources, uh, the question of trade and markets, the question of commodity uh, flow. These, uh, and above all, the, the question of, of, uh, of, of learning to live with change and the desire for independence, uh, these are the great uh, issues that face the nation. Uh, they're not likely to change in, uh, in the foreseeable future. Uh, in fact, they are sort of the heritage of the recent past, and uh, therefore uh, uh, one has some pretty good idea of what we're going to confront. I think that's a good note to end on, Harry. Yes, and Ambassador Habib, thank you very much for being with us, and I think we can only hope that, that the next generation and the present generation, the next generation of of, uh, of uh, diplomats uh, will offer to our uh, country uh, the kind of hard work and, and intelligent uh, uh, leadership that you have provided in the diplomatic service. Well, Thank you for being with us. Very kind, very kind. You're, and, o you're ultra kind. <laughs> okay. Thank you for being with us and thank you very much for joining us this evening on Open Window.